because Strange Cousins from the West being that first record uh, since, you know, Clutch became a, a totally self-contained entity uh, mm-hmm. from a record label standpoint. Uh, and this is a Jay Robbins record, Jay Robbins being, uh, you know, not only a, an incredible producer, but an amazing musician and songwriter in his own right. Uh, so let's talk about that, that um, striking out towards full independence and also how that may or may not have impacted uh, what you were writing in terms of how you were feeling and, you know, what what was happening in, in life and in the band and everything. Uh, well, to to back to get to that record, just to back it up a little bit, is the sure. previous records starting from Blast Tyrant forward, uh, you know, Robo Hive Exodus and Beale Street to Oblivion. We're on that label, DRT, and they owed us quite a bit of money, and we sued them, and we won, but they couldn't pay us the money still, and so in lieu of that the judge said okay you can't pay them the money you have to give them all the records back that you were putting out so we won this in a court thing so we had these three records and now we're talking about making a fourth one and then we realized okay we have we now own suddenly four of our our records why would we get in bed with another label we've done the major label thing we've done the independent label thing this was supposed to be like a 50 50 deal or whatever and because of the internet kind of at that time even becoming more robust it was obvious that we could reach our fans directly you know just speaking from the business angle of it yeah so that was suddenly a a, not a distraction but it was a bit overwhelming because i'm not a businessman um thankfully jack flanagan uh what it was and got us hooked up with eventually Stefan Koster, who was with Roadrunner. So we were surrounded with enough smart and good people to help us along the way. Um, and so that record, <laughs> uh, I don't really remember any, sp- that was a very, bl- we were still like very, I don't know, fixated on blues. And, and we still are. But this one, I think that record, I think about it, and it's a very blues record. Uh, not because we were sad. It just, you know, we liked we liked that sound. And um the I'm, I know this has it has nothing to do with music, but I remember this is sort of like a, a early lesson in label ownership. Suddenly we could do the package as complicated as we wanted to. Yeah. And it was approaching like pop-up book level of intricacy because it had this die cut thing that you opened up and on this, the CD had, instead of like the plastic thing, we had a a cork and then these things got shipped and they sat in a warehouse and it got hot and the corks were falling off because the glue got soft. And it was all these things that would have never have occurred to us if we could have blamed someone else and say oh you you messed this up but now it was on us <laughs> so we had to say okay we we lesson learned let's not use corks again or what what have you yeah. maybe we don't need to have um the album package be a pop up book maybe find a happy medium um uh but you know as far as the songs um i'm trying to put my my brain back in that time uh it was, um, I'm drawing a complete boring blank right now. If I could think of the track listing, you know, we and, had- and, uh, and, you, and you guys had worked with Jay before, but this was the second time, is that right? Yep, he did uh, Robot Hive Exodus, and he had done a, a number of other things with us here and there. Um recording you know it's kind of smaller batches but not full lengths and jay's uh jay's a genius and it's great to have a studio that we can go to and then come home to afterwards right and um that one i think it was recorded at his old spot at the old uh magpie cage in uh baltimore yeah yeah they're, they're, his new place is in baltimore as well um 
Yeah, uh, maybe if any of the songs might jog your memory, uh, you know, Mother Was Child opens the record. Mm -hmm. That record has Witch Doctor, uh, Freakonomics, Lee Stack, uh, Lee Stack Lightning. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is a very bluesy record. It, <laughs> like it, it is, and I think that was sort of like uh, not the end of that period, but it was sort of like we kind of wanted to explore as much of that as we could and i think that was the the album that was like okay now we've satisfied we've scratched that itch uh you know and, and it's it's a peculiar it's a peculiar record um but i think that's a, i think peculiar is good yeah and also again another thing that's that's great about clutch is you're a band with a catalog meaning you know, it's not like, oh, there's there's two great records and then a lot of forgettable stuff or, you know, there's this era and then there's that era. But it, but it's a robust catalog where you can sort of jump in at any point and get a different flavor. You know, it really, really has like a, an evolution that you can chart. And, you know, I, I think I always think that that's much more interesting, whether it's a band or a filmmaker or a painter, an author, you know, when there's an identifiable identity but also you can see them uh reaching for different things and, and trying different things along the way yeah i think any any journey it's not like a straight line you tack back and forth to get there yeah. and you know there's there's some great songs in there abraham lincoln is still one of my favorites um we still play fifty thousand watts quite a bit struck down um it's it's hard to write set lists these days because we do 20 songs a night and we've got at this point hundreds yeah yeah and and you and it, it, there's the thing where there's the songs you know you have to play or people are going to be angry <laughs> and then there's the you know the the recency bias where there's the new songs that a band always is eager to play live and then mm -hmm. somewhere in the margins between those two things <laughs> you have a, a handful of deep cut positions you can fill yeah it, it's it's a tough needle to thread i know there's people that and i'm sure this is the case with a lot of bands they have their their super fans that come to show after show after show that maybe get sick of hearing that one song right, right. i get it but then again there's the kid who's this is his first rock concert and he or she chose your band yeah to be number one yeah and they want to hear that song and yeah. just because someone's seen the band 30 times i don't know if that means they have seniority over the freshmen uh yeah. i don't think they do um so you you try to do a bit of both i mean we yeah. we beat electric worry to death and I, i've seen people like when we start playing it be like oh here we go but then there's also plenty of other people like oh this is what i was waiting for yeah um so there's no right or wrong answer you yeah. just try to do the best you can. Yeah, I don't personally need to hear Inner Sandman ever again. <laughs> and yet, when I inevitably take my kids to their first Metallica show, yeah, it would, hearing you say that, it would it would be insanely weird if it didn't appear. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it's like, you saw Metallica for the first time and they didn't play Inner Sandman? What? Yeah. Yeah, there is a, there is a give and take there. And you're right, there is there is really no such thing as seniority there. And if and if anything, it makes it more fun for the people who do see bands multiple times when there is that surprise in the set because sometimes there's there's only room for one surprise, but it's that much more yeah. like ah, that one was for us. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get it. 